In the last video, we compared the Dark Souls trilogy to The Lies of P by going over what makes a Souls game a Souls game and seeing if P could hold up against the originals. Obviously, there were going to be some differences with the stories, graphics, scenery, controls, mechanics, enemies, power scaling, and bosses. And again, given the time period for the releases of each title is to be expected. Of course, the Dark Souls trilogy stands the test of time, still attracting new players to this day and I wholeheartedly believe that The Lies of P will have the same effect. Now it's time to talk about a game that goes farther beyond the Souls trilogy and even became the architect for how we saw Dark Souls 3 and future Souls-like titles produced by From Software. Bloodborne was, is, and always will be one of the most praised titles ever to be delivered by From Software. And what's not to love? There are a lot of elements to this game that leave us wanting more, and we will dive into some of those elements in this comparison. That also means that a deeper dive into the Lies of Peace story is required because of the complexities that Bloodborne brings to the table. I don't want to harp on the same things that I did in the last video, such as there being no option to customize P or that the outfits that you find don't add extra attributes. We've already established that there are other ways that Liza P gives you extra attributes and how the outfits are the customizing, so I think it would be a huge disservice to the conversation at hand to repeat those things. And while we will do a deeper dive into Liza P's story, this will be more about Bloodborne to not repeat some of the previous talking points. There are a lot more similarities between these two titles than in the Souls trilogy, but there are definitely a lot of differences as well. Both titles had a lot of love and care put into developing them, and as we go on, we will see how much inspiration Lies of P pulls from Bloodborne. We will see things that both titles added to the Souls genre that make things both better and challenging, and some of the flaws with both titles. Now it's time to put Lies of P to the test. Does Lies of P do Souls better than Bloodborne? Good. All signed and sealed. Now, let's begin the transfusion. Oh, don't you worry. Whatever happens, you may think it all a mere bad dream. The story of Yarnum is a very dark and complicated story. In fact, you don't get much of a background for anything going on around you to start. It is one of From Software's more cryptic stories, and like in any of their games you are left to find and piece together a lot of the events that took place. Except now you don't have a clear foundation to start on. Before we continue, I want to say that by no means am I a lore hunter, and while I think what I do know of the lore is amazing, there is more than a slight chance that I may be butchering the Bloodborne story, so my apologies in advance. This is what we do know. It's the night of the hunt, and you play a character from a faraway land seeking the Pale Blood. In order to seek the Pale Blood, though, you must become a hunter. To become a hunter, you must take on a blood contract and take in the blood of Yarnum into your system through what is known as Yarnum's specialty, blood administration. After taking in the blood, you are sent on your way to battle through Yarnum's inhabitants who are infected with a plague that turns them into beasts. Of course, you can't just go out to fight without dying to the beasts in the clinic and visiting a place known as the Hunter's Dream, where you will receive your choice of weapons to use. After you light your first lamp, you'll go back to the Hunter's Dream and meet Garamin, the first hunter. From there, he'll give you advice on what to do as a new hunter, and after gaining insight upon discovering the first boss, you'll meet the living doll who helps you to level up. She even tells you a little backstory on Garamin. This is just the start though. There are many elements that are revealed in this story as you progress. Each that tells the tale of the founding of the Healing Church, the Scholars of Bergenworth, the discovery of blood ministration which was used to heal afflictions, the vile bloods of Canehurst Castle, the Executioners, the Marians, the Great Ones, the School of Menses, and so on and so forth. I don't want to dig too deep into these aspects though, seeing as there's a lot to talk about, but already you can see how complex this story is. There is no intro that speaks of these origins like in the Dark Souls trilogy, just a story that you as the player have to unravel. And nothing is ever as, as clear cut as it may seem, and though the vile bloods are considered corrupt due to the forbidden blood they were given, and being that they were against the healing church, there isn't a distinction between good and evil. 
just those who sought to heal through old blood, those who sought to be closer with the great ones, and those who served their duties to protect the Yarnamites from beasts. And they all seem to have one common goal, transcendence. Throughout the story, you can see and even feel the characters whose sanity is tested throughout the night of the hunt, and maybe even sympathize with their causes depending on the character. The obsession, the regret, the dying will to prevent further spread of the beast scourge, all of these elements make this an extremely compelling story. And to top it all off, the story gets even better in the Old Hunters DLC which gives more context to the story as a whole while still leaving mysteries for the player to solve at their discretion. The DLC even offers more emotion to the story seeing as these are the original characters who fell due to the slaughtering of those of the fishing hamlet and were sent to the hunter's nightmare by the orphan Akaz for being blood drunk. I'm going to stop right there for now and take some time to actually do some justice for the Lies of Peace story by going further into detail. And I know I talked about very surface level things in Bloodborne, but there are complexities in the Lies of P I want to dive into before continuing. I said before that in the Lies of P, things seem pretty straightforward until you reach a certain point and everything takes a turn. Let's start with the Grand Covenant of all puppets. 1. All puppets must obey their master. 2. A puppet is never allowed to harm its creator. 3. A puppet must protect its own existence as long as the protection doesn't conflict with the last two laws. And 4. A puppet cannot lie. From the beginning of the game, these four laws play a huge part, even forcing P to disobey the first law to progress. We can note that P is the only one who disobeys these laws due to the fact that he's not bound by them. The only thing that is left to question is why would the puppet frenzy even happen knowing these laws have been put into play? Here is where we begin to dive further into the story because even in the puppet frenzy, the puppets still obey the covenant to a degree. As P, you are to put a stop to the puppet frenzy by destroying the puppets. They are protecting their existence from you. As you go further into the story and you meet those infected by the petrification disease called the carcass, you'll notice that it's all out warfare between the two. So not only are they protecting their existence from you, but from the carcass as well. Let's skip ahead to the puppet king Romeo. On the first encounter, he puts on a show featuring P and Geppetto, showing his intentions and even trying to befriend you. Now we have to note here that Romeo was once human and he was turned into a puppet by Geppetto by his request but he was put under the Grand Covenant with every other puppet. But while you don't know it at the time, Romeo is obeying the fourth law of the covenant which states puppets cannot lie. And as things unfold further, you can look back to Romeo's show and begin to piece things together. Let's look at Geppetto. When you first meet him, he is being hunted by a stalker known as the Mad Donkey. And that is the only time you see him in any immediate danger. Why is he so casually roaming the streets to meet Pete? Why is he there to greet you right after the fight with Romeo? He is especially adamant about not trusting stalkers or alchemists. Why would he not want you to trust alchemists or stalkers? Well, if we look at Simon Manis, the leader of the alchemists, he tells you how he and Geppetto were once colleagues. So from the point of meeting Simon, you can tell he obviously knows something that Geppetto doesn't want Pete to know. That still doesn't explain why all the puppets are still following the Grand Covenant though. We know about the four laws of the Grand Covenant, but we never thought of what those laws meant, even knowing what we knew before the first true law. Law Zero, the creator's name is Giuseppe Geppetto. This is a law that you learn about after Geppetto is kidnapped and thus how the puppets are still following the laws of the Grand Covenant. They obey their master, which is to wipe everyone out, and they do not harm their creator Geppetto. He went through great lengths to see his own objectives through to the end, even making sure that P wouldn't find out the truth from those who knew it, even seeking to silence those such as Romeo. And P is left out of the Covenant to allow the P organ to gain as much humanity through Ergo to make the transfer to the nameless puppet in order to bring back Carlo. This is a rather impressive element that they brought to the story and one of the biggest key elements of making a Souls-like game. It never tells the story through copious amounts of cutscenes and the lore of everyone else is found through what the player chooses to do and explore. Now let's go back to Bloodborne and talk about Garmin. Garmin had a big part to play in the hunt seeing as he was the first to notice the beasts and fight against them. He had a workshop in the waking world for those he took under his wing. He is responsible for Lady Maria, who is his greatest protege and who also abused the blood arts. 
His actions inspired the healing church to train hunters and recruit Yarnamites to help with the hunt, eventually making his workshop useless and even worsening the problem with the affliction at hand. I won't go into the other details about how the dog came to life and how he is trapped in the hunter's dream by the great one known as the Moon Presence, but I will say that for what little time you do see him, he plays an advisor to the new hunter. Even in the end, he gives you the choice to allow him to kill you so that you can awaken from the dream and see the sunrise of the waking world, or to refuse his offer which triggers his boss fight. If you swallow all three of what are known as the one-third umbilical cords, you can fight the moon presence right after him. The story of Bloodborne is far more vague and complex than Lies of P, but we can already see some of the inspiration that was pulled to create the Lies of P. For instance, stalkers are to Lies of P what hunters are to Bloodborne. The stalkers are broken down into two groups, but they normally use the same weapons and have the same salute. The two groups are separated by name and societal hierarchy. The Bastards are from the noble and rich families and have a fast paced and pinkies up style of fighting, while the Sweepers are from the lower end of the societal totem pole with a more anything goes style. Either way, the goal of a stalker in the present day of the puppet frenzy is to protect any survivor left from the carcass of puppets. However, this isn't the case seeing how most of the stalkers you encounter have gone crazy or are just out for themselves. In the days before the puppet frenzy, stalkers took on other jobs outside of fighting. Hunters and Bloodborne all had one common goal from the start and that was the elimination of beasts. And due to the bloodlust that came from hunting, most of the hunters turned into the same beasts that they were hunting. Stalkers only went crazy due to the puppet frenzy. Most of them anyway. Now let's highlight the fact that Ergo and the Old Blood have a lot of things in common. For example, hunters seem to go blood crazy and turn into beasts while Ergo is the cause for the petrification disease and because of a certain quote-unquote miracle cure, turns humans into carcasses. However, Ergo does something beyond what the blood of Yarnum does. Ergo not only turns humans into monsters, it also humanizes puppets. And the fact that puppets are powered by Ergo, it only makes sense. You can see this through how Polandina confesses loving Lady Antonia and being concerned about her declining health due to the petrification disease. Now besides the beastly transformations of Bloodborne, State of Mind has more emphasis put on it with Insight. So now let's talk about the craziness of the people in Bloodborne. Where Sanity comes into play in Bloodborne is when we begin to dive into Bergenworth and the School of Minces. Both of these institutions can be compared to the Alchemists of Lysa P in certain ways. Bergenworth was a school dedicated to the study of how humans could transcend. A few students left and founded the Healing Church with one particular member, Lawrence the First Vicar. Thus, the School of Menses was also founded not long after, with its students being great contributors to the Healing Church. As I said before, the Healing Church focused mainly on healing through blood, which had a big hand in the beginning of the hunt, turning Yarnamites into beasts. The Healing Church also had a ranking system, with the School of Menses having a high seat, but the highest ranking was known as the Choir. The Choir was formed from some of the Menses students after the discovery of Abritas, to which they began to experiment with things such as lumen flowers to create creatures known as kin, and gained insight through communication with Abritas. The goal of everyone in the Church, the School of Menses, and the Choir is the ascension of humankind and each possesses a different method on how to go about this. This echoes very loudly when we begin to talk about the alchemists of Lies of P who sought to use the power of Ergo to do the same thing under Simon Manus' rule. While the origin story of Krat may not be the same as the founding of the Healing Church, it does tell the story of the development of Krat as a whole. Alchemists came to Krat and discovered Ergo and the relic of Trismegistus, and it was an alchemist by the name of Geppetto that would funnel its power into a mechanical heart which he would later place into all of his puppets, which is how Krop became what it was and is. In between this time, the alchemists had other agendas to pursue, for instance, gaining control over more land in Krop. To do this, they helped Andreas to bring relief to Moonlit Town by funding the building of the St. Frangelical Cathedral, and that led to a lot of other events that transformed the wayward Archbishop. I'm going to clarify something that I was inaccurate on when it comes to Ergo. Ergo is not simply one person, but many. It is many people's memories, essence, and time. This can be seen from the moment you step foot on the island of Alchemist. 
The further you travel, you can see the memories of Carlo's time in life, from his feelings to the people he connected with. And Sophia, like her mother, is what is known as a listener and can use the power of Ergo to manipulate time. Simon Manis, upon taking the mantle of leader of the alchemists, gets wind of Sophia's abilities and uses her to collect Ergo. Alchemists have a lot in common with Bergenworth, the Healing Church, and the School of Menses in the fact that they want to see humanity ascend. And with that being said, like all of the entities in Bloodborne look and pray to the Great Ones, the Alchemists have their version of a Great One known as the Arm of God, which plays the biggest part in the story. But before we get into the Arm of God, I'd like to highlight that miracle cure I mentioned earlier. Too much exposure to Ergo brought an uptick in cases of the petrification disease, causing a man by the name of Clark Shore to steal a concoction from the Alchemist and sell it as a miracle cure for the disease. However, what he didn't know was that the formula that he stole and sold was actually the formula that the alchemists planned to use to see their goals for humanity ascension through. And this led to the creation of the carcass. At some point, Andreas sought to steal the arm of God through Cecile to restore the city of Krat. Instead of reaching his original goal, he became the creature that you see in the game. It's the item that Simon Manish uses to reach his awakened god form and what Geppetto plans to use to bring back Carlo. I haven't even touched on the Thumerians of Bloodborne who were said to encounter the Great Ones possibly giving him the form that you see, but there isn't a comparison that I can think of in Lies of P that would match them. Maybe there will be in the DLC though. Basically, we can see a lot of inspiration taken from the Bloodborne story when we look at Lies of P. Both games are inspired by two great authors, with Bloodborne being inspired by the books of H.P. Lovecraft, and of course we know who inspired the lives of P. And both games use the aspects of these authors in their own amazing and twisted ways. I would say in this category that Bloodborne has great storytelling ability because it brings more mystery to the story being told. That's not to say that Lies of P doesn't bring some elements of the same type of mystery either, because while it doesn't have as much of the Bloodborne mystique, it does make you fish around Krat to find out what happened. In Bloodborne, you really have to search and read between the lines, and the only clues that they hand you are through the characters you meet, the things you find to read through exploration, and certain cryptic cutscenes. And while Bloodborne definitely brings the allure of mystery, Lies of P actually brings more immersive gameplay in its story with your choices, humanizing the main character and not just making it feel like a random character thrown into turmoil. I would also like to say that Bloodborne is working with a lot more inspiration to pull their story together than the Lies of P, but I'll save that for the end. Both are amazing stories, and after playing through both games multiple times, I can definitely say that Lies of P definitely goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bloodborne story-wise. The scenery in Bloodborne is amazing, and I must admit it will be one of my favorite things to talk about in this comparison. And while the frame rates are choppy, it's hard not to see the improvements made when compared to the first and second Dark Souls games. We all know by this point that graphically Lies of P is superior. We know that some of this is due to when each of the games were released, and we already know what had to go into the development for Lies of P to make it look and feel as good as it does and why. So there's no point in repeating the obvious when it comes to a newer Souls-like title. It's very clear that as you run through Bloodborne, you're going to run into quite a few hiccups graphically. And while it is choppy, it's still faster in pace than Souls 1 and 2. For me, there was the rare occurrence of creatures that fell through the landscapes, and we can't forget the classic dead enemies getting attached to the character, but I can see why these flaws exist within the game given the other unique elements that it brings to the table. The scenery in Bloodborne is one of them, and considering what was delivered in Demon Souls in the first two Dark Souls installments, it's a pretty huge step up. Yarnum's design is vastly superior when it comes to its Souls 2 cousin's landscapes. I personally believe that Bloodborne became the foundation for how future Souls-like titles from From Software would be seen in every way. They enhance the immediate areas around the player to make everything look and sound believable as you advance through the game. They also enhance the places in the distance that you can't get to to bring the vast city of Yarnum further to life. They don't stop there though, they also take areas with less assets in them and enhance the views as well. 
This is where I believe they mastered using not only the vibrant light colors, but also mixing in the darker colors to balance the tones. But that on top of all of the texturing of the surrounding areas, this helped bring out the setting of the story more. And with these same elements in the distance along with the added blurs, how could you not feel Yarnum's wonders? Later they would build upon this in Dark Souls 3, Sekiro, and even in Elden Ring. I would even go as far as to say that Elden Ring takes a lot of cues from the designs of Bloodborne. Not in the same way though. Since Elden Ring is an open world title, with some of its areas having less assets and others more, you can easily see how they were able to bring what they learned from Bloodborne into such a big game, expounding greatly on highlighting distant areas that this time you're able to travel to. They even take how cohesive everything is in Bloodborne and build on that to a much grander scale. Even the dungeons of Elden Ring pulls from the Thumerian Chalice dungeons, but that's a little off topic. As far as how the world comes together as a whole, Yarnum is a breath of fresh air as it brings back the cohesiveness found in the first Dark Souls and then some. Not only are you going in a gigantic loop, but there are shortcuts placed in areas that cross over to previously traversed areas, much like in Dark Souls 1. Except everything seems much larger, and when you think it can't get any better, they also make linear areas that branch off from the more cohesive world. Then, in Classic Souls fashion, there's an area that leads you to portals that takes you into a different place entirely. The place in question being the School of Menses, which brings you to a fork in the road placing you between the Nightmare Frontier and the Nightmare of Menses, which then leads you to Murgo's Loft. And even that is cohesive because there are two ways to get to the School of Menses. Even the Hunter's Nightmare, the game's linear DLC is amazing and each area that you go to has a shortcut as well, showing that their attention to detail when it comes to the world as a whole was not limited to just one aspect of cohesiveness, but each individual area as well. Everything about Bloodborne's map makes sense. You're never left guessing how each area connects to one another. Aside from the map itself, this is also the first time they brought about scenery changes through story progression, at least as far as I've seen. Please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but besides being able to unalive Guinevere, the Princess of the Sun, to change the scene in Honorlando, you never get to see things change scenery-wise through scripted progression. Meaning, the further you progress, the day changes to night, you'll see certain enemies' demeanors change, a blood moon comes in, and the unseen village opens up with more and new enemies. Though, I will say that it is pretty cool that they give you the choice in Dark Souls 1 to change the scenery of an area. Please keep in mind you'll only see this change if you've been to the Unseen Village earlier in the game. These aren't big changes, but it does show how they evolved in their attention to detail. Even the Hunter's Dream changes as you progress and gain more insight. From Software really put in a lot of effort to create this world even with its graphical flaws, and its inspiration more than shows in the Lies of P. Of course, we went over the many aspects of detail put into the area designs of Liza P when it comes to the textures, sounds, and of course the change in weather and time of day as you progress through the game. I would now like to talk about the inspiration that could be seen throughout certain parts though. The city of Krat as a whole could easily be compared to Yarnum as far as design goes with the exception of a couple of areas. For instance, Vanini Works, the Stella Opera House, and the Grand Exhibition Gallery are the best examples of what separates the areas of Liza P from the areas of Bloodborne. The areas in Liza P that could be easily compared to certain Bloodborne areas are the Path of Misery, Moonlight Town, and the Path of the Pilgrim, which can be compared to the Frontier Headstone areas of Bloodborne. Though I would go as far as to say there is more to Hemwick Charnel Lane in the Forbidden Woods. And while I could compare the designs of the Healing Church to the St. Frangelical Cathedral, Lies of P puts more emphasis on taking us through the cathedral as a whole, whereas the Healing Church doesn't feel as big as it's made out to be. It's amazing to see some of the inspiration pulled from Bloodborne in Lies of P areas, but it's even more amazing that there are more than a few differences in their areas as well. We wouldn't want the Lies of P to look exactly like Bloodborne. It shows how unique they were willing to make the game look and at the same time draw the same inspiration of despair from Bloodborne. I talked about scenery changes through time of day, but there are two more things I would like to highlight. As I said about Bloodborne, after a certain point in Lies of P, certain enemies will change their demeanor, though the area in which you will encounter this can't be visited prior and it's only in this specific area that this change can be seen. I think it's important to note this because there are a couple of areas in Bloodborne where you see this 
And in both games, there are specific reasons for this. Now, Bloodborne, I had this theory that certain enemies were praying to one of the great ones and the great ones they were praying to is the moon presence. This apparently isn't the case. They're just sleeping. When I looked into this, I was surprised that out of all the detail and complexities put into this game, that they would make this element a simple one. Keep in mind, I said that I don't fully understand the story of Bloodborne, so forgive me if to some of you watching this, I'm stating an obvious fact. Again, this only happens after a certain point in time in the game, and after this point, time changes causing certain enemies to sleep and more to show up and some to leave certain places as you progress. Which is why I bring this up now rather than later. In the lives of P, puppets just lost their king and a sadness seems to have taken over this certain group of puppets. This is where I kind of take issue. Why is it only this group in this area? There are plenty of puppets to go around the city of Krat that should feel this way. I wish that they would have taken the opportunity to do this in other areas that you have already visited rather than just the one you're unfamiliar with. Not a big deal though, because Liza P took another approach with an area that you are familiar with, and that's Krat Central Station and the areas around it. Not only do they unlock the areas surrounding where you began the game and change the enemies, but they completely change the landscape as a whole. Within just a couple of days by the game's time of progression, this once well put together area has been decimated. That's one element I wish they would have shown in Bloodborne, the ability to change landscapes as a whole, not just the time of day or the skies. Another thing I would like to point out is the map size in both games. I've already said that The Lies of P is a smaller game with smaller areas that leave you wanting more. I could almost say the same thing about certain areas in Bloodborne though as well. Bloodborne areas definitely left me wanting more in certain portions of the game. For instance, Kanehurst Castle is one of my favorite areas, and from how big it looks on the outside, it definitely didn't feel the same traveling through it. It feels like a place that I can just breeze by. It's not just that area either, there are a couple of other areas like that as well. However, certain areas like the School of Minces serve as a purpose of travel, so that much is understandable. Not only that, but the sheer size of the game itself plays a part in that as well. I can't leave out the fact that there are still the Chalice Dungeons to account for. But that being said, one of the final complaints I have against the lives of P in this regard is that the areas didn't feel as diverse as Bloodborne, but again, it is still a smaller game. Regardless of any minor issues I have with both of these respective titles, I love the feeling that they bring out through their designs. And while there are plenty of similarities to compare, there are still plenty of differences that make both games' designs unique as well. Bloodborne's controls and mechanics aren't much different from its soul's counterparts in certain aspects. Running, attacking, dodging, and parrying remain the same throughout both the series. However, there are some changes that should be highlighted. I would also like to note that I won't be spending a lot of time on this subject because then I would be repeating myself in regards to the last comparison. So let me start by saying that the controls and mechanics are still very convenient and more so than the controls and mechanics of Lies of P, which I broke down in detail in the comparison to Souls. Bloodborne is a tad more technical than the Dark Souls trilogy though. For instance, parrying in Souls is easier because you have shields and all you have to do is learn the timing. In Bloodborne, your source of this mechanic is a gun in which you have limited shots, so in every way it feels like you have to be extremely precise in timing and monitoring your resources for said shots. And you can add more bullets by sacrificing some of your health or by using Carol Ruins which you'll gain access to as you progress through the game, which I'll explain in more detail later on. And even with some of the choppiness of the game, you'll still find it faster and smoother than the first two iterations of Souls. The other technical aspect of Bloodborne is that it focuses more on where to damage bosses, which most of the time is limbs depending on the fight, that will cause them to bleed out and or stagger them to help you in the department of damage and visceral attacks. And yes, your weapons do have a limit, just not one that you can see immediately like the small red bar underneath your weapons in the last two Souls games or Lies of P. Instead, you'll know your weapon is losing its edge based off of the lack of damage that you deal to enemies, but you can repair them in the Hunter's Dream Workshop at the cost of your blood echoes. 
Oh yeah, this is a slight problem for me, and this has more to do with me than it does the game, but they do change up a couple of buttons when it comes to healing and sacrificing your health to gain more Quicksilver bullets. In the Souls trilogy to heal, you normally press square to do this, and since not much changes in Bloodborne in terms of everything else, in my mind, square is always healed to which I normally end up sacrificing health rather than healing a couple of times before I remember that triangle is actually the heals button. Also, before I forget to mention this, you can also extend your weapon to do more damage as well, which for some reason I tend to do in the heat of battle by accident. This is one of those mechanics that I can see the use for in certain instances, but with my playstyle, I can do without it most of the time. Monitoring everything you have in Bloodborne is also more important because as far as I know, you don't have a healing option that is limited that you don't have to farm for, and you don't have anything to give you unlimited bullets. Instead, Carol Runes, help add more to what you can carry in terms of blood vials and quicksilver bullets. And whatever else you can't carry on you will be put into storage. So if you farm enough and you're stacked to the limit on both, you won't have any issues with the items, unless you meet a boss that you struggle with. Other than that, the menu for equipping things is a tad more convenient than Souls and way more convenient than the lives of P, and the fact that the menus for the things you have equipped has been condensed into what other menus use as the menu to get to the other menus you need. So there's no excess menu scrolling, you just select whatever square and item box and it takes you to the designated menu. Of course you can move and see through the first menu, but you can't see past the item selection menu, so there's that, but it's still quicker than the others, giving you better ease of access. I already explained in the last video about how the Lies of P menu was convenient and inconvenient at the same time. Also how there are a lot of excess ways to use your items like the quick select and the top and bottom tool belts, and how you have to highlight either belt and select the items. With that out of the way, this game is still far more technical than Bloodborne in terms of fighting, having to worry about your weapons health, your fabled arts, the fury attacks from bosses and certain opponents, stamina, and of course perfect guarding or parrying to wear down your enemies to give them a fatal blow. The thing that makes these two games comparable is that rather than limb damage, you can break certain opponents' weapons, leaving them at a permanent disadvantage. And they extend this further by leaving certain bosses weapons damaged rather than repairing those same bosses weapons. I will say that in terms of technicalities, while Lies of P takes the cake in this area, Bloodborne's mechanics definitely helps to even out the playing field between encounters just as much as Lies of P does. Of course Bloodborne's hitboxes are still far more forgiving than Lies though. Again, both games require precise timing, but the margin for timing feels more critical in Lies of P. And both games focus on directional dodging, however in Bloodborne it doesn't feel as punishing to take a hit if I dodge in the wrong direction. This is the last thing I'm going to touch on before we move to the next subject, and I didn't realize how inconvenient this was until I did a couple more playthroughs of Bloodborne, but I absolutely hate the fact that I have to keep going back to the Hunter's Dream to fast travel to different areas. This is probably the most inconvenient aspect of this whole game. I mean, in Dark Souls 1, you couldn't fast travel at all for the first half of the game, but even after you gained the ability to do so, I didn't have to return to Firelink Shrine. In Bloodborne, it's a constant hassle to fast travel and it never changes. So I love the fact that Lies of P allows you to travel to and from any stargazer you discover throughout the game. And if anyone knows of an item that allows travel between lanterns that I don't know about, feel free to educate me in the comments below. Bloodborne works the same way as every other one of its Souls cousins in Lies of P when it comes to enemies and power scaling. The further you progress, the stronger enemies get along the way. The Chalice Dungeons is a faster process in this aspect depending on what level you are and when you choose to unlock each dungeon. Then it goes a step beyond that when you unlock the Defilement Dungeons because the Defilement Chalice Dungeons you not only have to deal with stronger enemies, but you also lose attributes that you gain by leveling up such as health. And like in the last comparison, I will say the same thing when it comes to balancing the playing field between the enemies and the player. I don't want to get too far ahead because it doesn't start off like that in Bloodborne. In the beginning, you actually start off with a disadvantage having no weapons when you're forced to fight your first enemy. You can't even level up until after you discover your first boss. 
So you're left to die, wake up in the hunter's dream and select your first weapons, farm the first area for blood vials and quicksilver bullets, all while hoping that you can keep your blood echoes intact for the moment that you can level up. I'm not saying this to the seasoned players of Bloodborne, I'm talking to the new players. It is very easy to get swarmed by the locals at the beginning if you're not careful. Oh yeah, and if you lose your blood echoes, you'll have to look for the enemy with glowing eyes to retrieve them. Sometimes they'll be the ones that killed you, but this isn't always the case. In other cases of losing your blood echoes, you'll have to look for a puddle of blood with a light protruding from it, which can be very difficult to find due to either thinking that you're looking for the enemy that has them or dodging a boss in the arena to retrieve them. If you don't see an enemy in possession of them and you can't seem to find them lying around, just try and remember the last spot you died at. After you get past the initial butt clinch that is the beginning of Bloodborne, you'll be able to finally level up after gaining insight. However, the rest of the power scaling for the player relies on you finding bloodstones to fortify your weapons and the tools you need to enhance your weapons with blood gemstones and the tool to extract arcane haze needed for the chalice dungeons. The other tool you'll need to find is for the memory altar which allows you to use Carl runes to enhance other aspects such as how many blood vials and quicksilver bullets you can carry. Insight is extremely important in the world of Bloodborne and depending on how much you have, you'll be able to see the changes that work for and against you the more you accumulate. For instance, you can't level up until you discover your first boss because you have zero insight. For the record, the first boss could either be the Cleric Beast or Father Gascoigne. Take it from me when I say, to the new players out there, find the Cleric Beast. Anyway, one insight awakens the doll so you can level up. You can also use the Old Hunter and the Beckoning Bell during this time as well, which allows you to summon help at the cost of one insight. And the more you hold, the more things change. One of these changes is being able to see Lesser Amygdala hanging around Yarnum before the Blood Moon phase of the game. The things that work against you are that certain enemies will get buffs, Mad Ones will spawn at certain areas in Hemwick Charnel Lane, and you will be more vulnerable to Frenzy by enemies who deal this type of damage. Now I've never tried this, but I have heard it said on multiple occasions that you will not have to deal with the Mad Ones in the Witch Fight if you don't have Insight, however I've never spent my Insight before reaching this point. Speaking of spending insight, they are also used at one of the messenger bath shops to purchase things needed to open certain chalice dungeons and to purchase fire and bolt papers which temporarily enhance your weapons with elemental damage, much like the pine resins of souls. And the more you progress not only through the main game, but the more you progress through the chalice dungeons, the more things will unlock for you to purchase. The other bath simply requires the blood echoes that you acquire as currency to purchase things like blood vials, quicksilver bullets, antidotes, pebbles, poison knives, throwing knives, other materials used to gain access to the chalice dungeons, outfits, and so on and so forth. While blood echoes are important to level up, purchase certain items, and fix and fortify your weapons, Insight does more in-game changes that you really have to pay attention to. And if you don't have the madman's knowledge found around to give you more insight, or you waste your insight using the old hunter's bell to summon NPCs for boss fights that you may be struggling with, they are harder to come by. And you get insight through discovering and defeating bosses, but again, if you find yourself struggling with a boss, then it's not going to do you much good. With that being said, there is one more extremely important thing that insight does, and that's managing your beasthood stat. The less insight you have will determine your beasthood. On top of that, the higher your beasthood stat goes, the higher your physical attacks will be, especially if you use certain items, like weapons made for beasthood and outfits. The payoff for this is that the higher your physical attacks are in beasthood, the lower your defense will be. This is another thing I have little experience with because of the simple fact that part of me doesn't like going through the game with little to no insight. I'm the type of person to where if I'm below a certain amount of insight, I will use every bit of madman's knowledge I have to regain the insight I used. With all of this in mind, you have more than enough to tackle the game at the pace of your choosing just like with the other titles. Everything becomes balanced after the first boss fight and it's not hard to get all of the tools you need seeing as one of them is right in your path after your second boss fight and the others are well, just explore the game and you'll see what I mean. Trust me when I say it's worth exploring in this game. Now on to the enemies of the game which there are plenty of. As I said before, the locals will swarm you at the beginning if you're not careful. You won't have to deal with the slow and clunky motions of Dark Souls 1 or the bad hitboxes and bad directional animations of 2. 
Enemies move at your pace or faster depending on the enemies you face. Certain enemies do frenzy damage while others do poison damage. And of course you'll find that the dogs can be an issue as normal, but they're going to be the least of your worries later on. There are an assortment of enemies both in the main game and DLC that are imaginative, powerful, and very frustrating at times. That's the beauty of these games though. I like that they don't just allow me to get to the next boss fight. I haven't even touched on the chalice dungeons yet where things can get really interesting. While a lot of the chalice dungeons look similar to one another, for the most part, enemies will not. In fact, most of the enemies you encounter in the chalice dungeons are nothing like what you would see in Yarnum. Yeah, you'll get a few of Yarnum's greatest hits from the main game, but the dungeons will continue to introduce new enemies as you continue to unlock and delve into each one. These enemies seem to be twice as strong depending on the level that you're at and which chalice dungeon you're in. I still haven't completed all of the chalice dungeons because I am currently stuck on a defilement dungeon, but man, some of these guys hit harder than bosses. And when you lose some of your health in the defilement dungeons, it becomes more of a hassle to deal with these said enemies. However, they are a really good way to level up and I would highly recommend going through each one as you progress through the game. Oh, and if you don't finish a whole dungeon, it's okay because as long as you found the lamps to the hunter's dream, you can continue where you left off. In terms of comparing the scaling of Bloodborne and Lies of P, the latter is more sophisticated in terms of what you can do with said weapons, such as the ability to switch handles and level up your weapons and even altering your handles. I could easily say that what you can do with the P organ is similar to what you can do with Carol runes, but on a grander scale and accept that you can't just simply switch out your attributes without resetting the organ as a whole. Again, Bloodborne's outfits actually affect your attributes, whereas Lies of P outfits are simply for show. And like in Bloodborne, you have to progress to get the tools needed to craft and upgrade your Legion Arm and P organ, except that you have to actually explore to get your tools in Bloodborne and even search for said materials to equip and upgrade. In Lies of P, the only thing you need to do is progress through the story to get Geppetto and Veniti to upgrade your P organ and Legion Arm. The only things you'll need to explore for are the resources necessary to upgrade your weapons organ and legion arm. And while you don't have the outfits that change your character's stats, you still have other means to enhance your stats in Lies of P and way more than you do in Bloodborne. Both have all the items needed to balance the playing field between you and the enemy, and both have very creative enemies which get stronger and that you'll see more of the more you progress through the games. The things that Lies of P lacks are of course the DLC which we are currently waiting for and the Chalice Dungeons. Though looking at it, I don't really think that it makes sense for Lies of P to have dungeons of its own, but I could also see the places where the developer could fit their own versions into the game. Maybe like a boss rush of some sort through Ergo. You can clearly see some comparisons between enemy scaling in both games and more than enough differences in terms of how they allow the player to scale their characters, but now it's time to talk about the challenges of the bosses between games. You'll find a great assortment of bosses in Bloodborne. The fights themselves are more technical than in the Souls games as well. For the first few bosses of the game, you'll be dealing with beasts, which is a good chance to learn not only the boss's patterns for dodging and finding blind spots, but also to learn about limb damage, which is what makes this game more technical than Souls. Beast bosses can almost be compared to bosses in the Lies of P for the fact that they are almost always on go time and that they can easily close the gap if you create distance. And really, that's most of the bosses in Bloodborne as well, with the exception of humanoid bosses who have a balanced fighting style. Compared to the Lies of P though, these bosses are still more chill. And yet, while I always felt that Bloodborne was way more challenging in terms of boss fights when comparing them to Souls bosses, the Lies of P still wins in this category. Of course you can parry certain bosses with a well-timed shot, but the risk feels greater than perfect guarding in Lies of P. You just have more limited resources with you only being able to carry a certain amount of quicksilver bullets, and some guns use up more bullets than others. For beast fights, limb damage is the easiest way to beat them. Hitting the arms or legs of a beast will slow them down significantly, causing them to bleed out. And if you continue to stack on the limb damage, you'll get a chance to perform a visceral attack. You don't have a lot of time to pull this off, so you have to make sure you have the usual patterns and blind spots memorized. And you have other resources to help as well. 
like the beast blood pellets will give you a temporary boost in strength. However, if you have a lot of insight, I found that there won't be much of a boost seeing as it works against the beast hood stat. And even though the beast bosses of the game can be wild, they do at least give you reprieve to heal and buff yourself. And while those moments may feel short lived, every moment counts. Now limb damage isn't just a beast thing, this applies to certain other bosses as well such as Amygdala. And being that this is a great one boss, some of these fights come with a catch. And normally the catch for these kinds of bosses is that you have to look for an actual weakness. Meaning you can't just hit this boss anywhere and think you're going to do significant damage. So in the case of Amygdala, hitting its arms and head is the way to go. In the case of Rom, not only do you have to get around her eight-legged reach arounds, but you also have to hit her on her sides to hurt her because hitting her on her head does little damage. Other great one fights like Murgo's Wet Nurse and the Orphan of Cause are just like normal fights where you just look for an opening dodge attack and repeat the cycle again. Some great one fights truly highlight how technical boss fights can be given that they force you to find and attack the weak points. Again, not all but some. The humanoid fights are just like any old souls fight where you spend most of your time dodging, attacking, and looking for a parry window, but some are actually unique and annoying. Seasoned vets of this game know who I'm talking about. Father Gascoigne gives you the best of both worlds in terms of beasthood by the fact that you fight him while he's a hunter at first, and that he literally goes beast mode on you once you lower his health at a certain point. Or the fact that you have to continue to destroy Logarius' swords to avoid an onslaught of attacks all while avoiding him. And every one of these types of bosses are equally as susceptible as you in every way. Maybe even more so to give the player more of an advantage and still challenge you. On top of the fire paper, bolt paper along with other tools, the carol runes, the weapons you fortify, and the blood gemstones that you can equip to your weapons to make them stronger, I'd say that the fight should be more than even. And let's not forget about the old Hunter Bell either. You'll find that Bloodborne has a healthy assortment of bosses in the main game. Some optional, some gank bosses, and one repeat boss fight that comes with a significant change and my only kryptonite out of all of the bosses. The Chalice Dungeons are a little bit of a different story. You'll find unique bosses that you haven't fought in the main game. You'll find repeat bosses that you fought in different Chalice Dungeons or some you've encountered in the main game. You'll find bosses that are normal enemies in the main game, and there are more gank bosses in the Chalice Dungeons as well. Some come with their own lore and some are just left without explanation at all. I can say this, even without the lore you'll know that every boss served a purpose, especially in the Chalice Dungeons. I think that Liza P has better balancing of these elements when it comes to its bosses. While they don't have many, there are still some very unique boss fights, a couple of repeat fights that come with changes of course, and a couple of gank fights. The amount of technical detail for the bosses of both games is similar and unique due to what you have to manage as the player. Though I would say that bosses of Lies of Peace seem to give very little reprieve when it comes to healing, even forcing the player to give up certain openings created for attacking in exchange to heal or buff. I would say that any Souls or Souls-like game has that issue, but I feel it more in Lies of P. There are a couple of things I didn't cover yet. The first being yet another advantage that the player has in both games, and that's the ability to recover a certain amount of health lost by hitting the enemy for a small period of time. I found that in a game that limits how many times you heal, at least depending on how many blood vials you farm or buy, that this was a convenient feature to have if you don't want to constantly stop and heal. Lies of P more than took their inspiration from this and it shows by the way that they created their bosses to be even allowing its bosses to regain a certain amount of health if you don't continue to deal damage. I honestly don't think I would have made it through Lies of P without that mechanic because some of the bosses are bad enough but if they were the only ones able to recover the way they do I would have lost it. The second thing I didn't cover was boss phases. Bloodborne is the first game out of the From Software Workshop where boss phases are clear and consistent, and you'll see quite a few bosses with two and three phases throughout the game. I mean, Father Gascoigne could be your first or second boss fight and this guy has three phases, so right out of the gate, Bloodborne wastes no time in showing you the temperature of what you can expect going in. And like in classic Souls fashion, you'll see a clear distinction of what a new phase looks like with the change in bosses' attacks and the aggressiveness. And I could be wrong, but Ludwig is the only one that I've seen with an actual cutscene that shows his next phase. 
Even without the cutscene though, it wouldn't be hard to tell this next phase with a giant holy greatsword coming at you. I won't go into the same things with Lies of P though because at this point we know how phases work. What I will say though is when it comes to boss phases in Lies of P, some of them can feel a little discouraging given the fact that you just took down a whole health bar for bosses that feel challenging and then you have to go through another phase where those same bosses get even more challenging and then they get another full health bar to boot. Yeah, with Bloodborne, boss fights are the way nature intended with the phases changing as the health bar goes down. At least it feels like progress is being made rather than it feeling like you have to backtrack. It still doesn't take anything away from lies though. Bloodborne has a grand total of 33 bosses which is more than what Souls 1 and 3 have showing that they have found the balance of quality and quantity. It's not too many and not few either. And yet that still doesn't overshadow Lies of P that as of right now has 25 if you include the mini bosses. While I did enjoy the bosses of Bloodborne, I like the quality of bosses in Lies of P better for some reason. I mean the bosses in both fit their respective stories, but it seems like there was less to work with when it came to Lies of P, forcing NeoWiz in Round 8 to be a bit more creative with the bosses you encounter. From Software took the inspiration from HP Lovecraft simply for designing purposes and created their own tale around it. I also have to say that when it comes to visceral attacks and fatal blows, it's still far easier to perform fatal blows due to the fact that not only with enough attacks but with enough perfect guarding, this option will be available, and also for the fact that you get a marker on where to stand to perform them. It's not a necessity in Bloodborne because the humanoid bosses are easier to parry and to perform visceral attacks on, but I always seem to struggle with some of the bigger bosses when it comes to my positioning. With that being said, I also struggle with parrying bigger bosses due to timing. Aside from the bosses, I am still very grateful that you can collect your ergo outside of the boss arena rather than having to fight the boss to search for the ergo you lost. Like in Souls, I tend to lose a lot of blood echoes and having to find a puddle in the middle of a boss fight is a little bit ridiculous. The bosses in both games aren't perfect, but they're still enjoyable and definitely live up to Souls-like quality. Now it's time to talk about some of the things I didn't cover throughout this comparison and whether or not Lies of P does it better than Bloodborne. One of the things that I didn't talk about and I honestly have little to say is using Arcane and Bloodborne. Throughout playing any kind of Souls and Souls-like game, I always go for strength builds. My playstyle has always been an up close and personal one even though fighting at a distance seems more advantageous. Though so the new players can know, Arcane is an option if you want to do something different. However, compared to the Souls trilogy, Arcane seems more limited. I mean technically you're still using arcane when you use the bolt and fire papers but that still requires you to get up close and personal. And even some of the blood gemstones and certain weapons you obtain utilize arcane of some sort if you equip them. I personally only use the paper because I focus more on doing physical damage. And I should note that in Lies of P you have more options when it comes to elemental builds, whether it be with your weapons or the legion arm. Another thing I didn't get into was the differences in the challenge rate between the two games when it comes to New Game Plus. I don't believe I touched on this with the Souls trilogy either. I know everyone is going to have a different feel on this subject upon making it to New Game Plus, but normally I can't feel the difference between playthroughs. Even though each time the enemies and bosses stats go up, throughout the Souls trilogy I couldn't really feel the difference. In Bloodborne and Lies of P though it's a little bit of a different story. While most of the bosses in Bloodborne didn't feel any different and sometimes easier, Abritus and three of the DLC bosses felt more difficult than normal. It was about the same in Lies of P when I got to the Green Monster of the Swamp. Obviously the challenges of New Game Plus are going to differ depending on the player because of the different playstyles that people use and what they use with their respective playstyles. The last thing I didn't touch on is the multiplayer aspect. I talked about this in the last comparison and after a few conversations in the comments of the review of Lies of P, I am more than understanding of why multiplayer wouldn't work here. Power scaling bosses is an extra hassle and honestly, Lies of P is tough enough as it is. So even adding another person into the mix would just make things tougher than normal, especially with the final boss. And with Bloodborne, I've never done co-op and at this point I don't feel the need to do so. 
I've also never invaded or been invaded by anyone either. From what I understand though, co-op works the same in Bloodborne as it does with the Souls trilogy. And I'm going to group the Spectre and the Old Hunter's Bell in with the multiplayer topic. Again, your Spectre seems more brain dead than the Hunters that you summon in Bloodborne. The Hunters heal themselves, they have different fighting styles, and there are a variety to summon. The Spectre is a one-trick pony, only gaining the weapons that you would get from the bosses you're fighting in the moment, and it lacks the ability to buff itself, causing you to have to fight the boss and play babysitter. And while I didn't compare the gold coin fruit to gaining insight, it didn't seem as relevant as I thought it would be, seeing as the gold coin fruit is used mostly to purchase wish stones for your wish cube to even be able to buff said specter. Gaining gold coin fruit is a matter of waiting for time to pass and there are no other significant changes that I found that takes place from it. Now it's time to get to the who did it better part. I personally love a story that's not in your face. I love the fact that there are very few cutscenes giving you more time to play both games. However, I said this in the boss segment and really this applies to both games stories is that Bloodborne utilizes multiple stories for its enemies and bosses and these elements help for its own unique story to come together. Liza P takes one story and reconstructs it to tell a unique story of its own. Some of the characters' stories in Liza P are changed greatly to fit the overall story and there seem to be more room for enemy and boss creativity. And while the story isn't as complex as Bloodborne's, it's still far more balanced than Bloodborne in terms of what is revealed and what isn't. And Bloodborne allows you to help certain survivors by sending them to the clinic or the cathedral ward, but Liza P allows you far more options in this regard in terms of the lies you tell and who you choose to help. Liza P feels far more engaging when it comes to NPC interaction. Though I do like the fact that you can take oaths to use oath runes in Bloodborne, which is the equivalent of covenants in the Souls trilogy. While this is cool, I don't think it makes interactions better than Liza P. Again, graphically, Liza P is leagues better than Bloodborne, and again, we have to remember the time periods that each games were released. So Bloodborne isn't going to be as great in this area, but I will say that it's far better graphically than the first two Dark Souls. I love the fact that Bloodborne is far more technical than the Souls series, but it is nothing compared to the Lies of P. One of the areas that I think Bloodborne outshines Lies of P in is the convenience of the controls when it comes to item selection. And I love the scenery of both, but this is another area where Bloodborne outshines Lies of P. There are more areas and more creativity put into those said areas. And while it doesn't have the time or weather changing of Liza P, the selection of areas that come together are amazing, giving you a balance of a loop around Yarnum, areas that connect in imaginative places that are linear. I love the music in both, but I have to give it to Liza P in terms of soundtracks. It gives you a nice mix of not only boss music, but music around the city of Krat depending on where you go, as well as the records you can collect. And I have to give the boss element to Liza P. I give them this category for the challenge and the design. Even with the hopeless feeling of having to fight certain bosses that get a full health bar in their next phase, it's the urgency factor that keeps me on my toes and more engaged with them. So my overall opinion is that while Lies of P does take a lot of inspiration from Bloodborne, Lies of P indeed does it better. But what do you think though? Do you think Lies of P did it better than Bloodborne? Leave me your thoughts in the comments below. And be sure to catch the next and final video of the series where I put Lies of P against Sekiro. Until then, you all be easy and I'll see you next time. I bid you farewell. It has been a pleasure. May the good blood guide your way.